Welcome to this week's episode of Deep Tech 315. That's Doug. I'm Gene. We got a fun episode. We're going to talk about NVIDIA earnings and more importantly, the outlook. Second, what's happening in the EV space? Rivian, Lucid down big this week. And last, we're going to talk about Elon's opportunity with X.AI and how it fits into the pantheon of foundation models. And so we'll take it to the top. All attention this week, clearly on NVIDIA, in case you didn't see it. Uh, they exceeded estimates by a little bit. They raised uh, guidance by about 9% for the April quarter, the current quarter we're in. And by last count, my last count is analysts overall have taken their numbers up by about 20%. Their earnings numbers up for calendar 24, up about 20%. The stock's up about 15% as the time of this recording. So actually, NVIDIA's multiple on the next 12 months out has actually declined slightly today. It trading, it's trading right about 28 times uh, those expectations. And so I'm going to pause there. That was kind of the, the, how the quarter was. But more importantly, what did you take out of the call? That it feels kind of like AI is this unstoppable freight train, at least the infrastructure spend on it so far. I mean, NVIDIA now has had, I think, a string of almost four quarters uh, going back to, to calendar Q2 last year when they really had this huge inflection. Um, and, you know, the, the hyperscalers are investing. We're hearing more about sovereign nations potentially, you know, building their own models. They'll need to invest. Um, and so even though it feels like the stock has been on fire, the chart is up and to the right, um, it's been supported to your point by the numbers. You know, this hasn't been really a story of multiple expansion. It's been a story of business expansion. Mm -hmm. And I think the question that investors just have to ask now is, can this momentum continue? Because I think everybody sort of knows and anybody who's followed semis sort of knows like this historically has been a very cyclical industry and eventually you get to a point where you know demand uh slows down infrastructure is built out and uh these stocks then go in the other direction in the in the counter cyclical move um mm -hmm. definitely i'm, I'm not sure of, how to I think about highlight that. that scar tissue piece to it a lot of scar tissue in the stock if you look at the call at 50 analysts that cover it they're all over the board in terms of how they see this playing out and typically the ones that have been covering it longer have this belief that there's going to be some blow up. It's surprising to go back and look at in their this in their January of 23 quarter, so a year ago, their business was down 20% year over year. In the April quarter, it was down like 14% year over year. And then as you said, kind of in the back half of the year, it really started accelerating 100, 250% kind of growth. It will grow around 230% in this current April quarter. And so you're exactly right. That's this kind of boom and bust uh, scar tissue that is is I think plaguing some of the, or impacting the multiple impacting the view that people have. And I come back to like, is this, is AI going to have that same boom and bust or is this at least for the next few years, such a big paradigm shift that it will power through what has been a history of boom and bust. It feels like that's becoming the more likely scenario, right? That this investment level, this investment cycle continues for, instead of it being whatever, 18 months maybe is, is what optimists thought it was when this started, maybe it is more like three years, you know, maybe it is more like four years and we've got a pretty long investment pathway here. Obviously Nvidia, they have new chips coming out, H200, um, that'll be their newest chip. And I think you're gonna see some upgrade from that. They talked about continuing to have demand that exceeds supply on the call. And so I think the reality is this AI cycle probably just extends much longer than uh, maybe even the optimists thought before the call. Uh, Jensen Wong's final comment, his closing comment. I always remember just stick on, just stay on that the conference call, and listen to what he has to say. He basically built the case that the compute market is going to be several hundred billion dollars. He said in the next five years, and you can kind of go through some loose math and and conclude that they can grow their business at. Uh, greater than 15% in calendar 26, 27, and 28. And I think I would consider that a win. He does highlight, uh, you talked about the hyperscaler piece. Phase two is enterprise, which would be like Copilot, ServiceNow, Salesforce. Part three is heavy industry with generative AI. And then the sovereign piece the, that you, you, you talked about. So if he's right, 
uh, we're going to have more than 18 months agree with you. This could go on for the next three years and ultimately grow at 15% plus. You know, uh, I'll just throw one last thing that does triangulate with what AMD has been saying too: 400 billion by 2027. So we're starting to get a couple of those couple hundred billion dollar numbers out there. Makes sense. Second topic is the EV space. Those who've been following Doug and I, this has been a, a fun debate, fun topic. And this one in particular is a fun one because Rivian here, uh, based at the time recording, is down about 25%. They lowered their delivery expectations for calendar 24 from roughly, the street was roughly at 85,000 uh, units. Uh, the street knew that EV demand was slowing. Analysts knew that when they put the 85,000 number out there and they had guided to mid 50s or high high 50s so call it a 35 percent guide down stock down 25 percent i remember when i saw the numbers doug i remembered a debate that we had about nine months ago stock was 17 dollars. i really wanted to have one of our funds investing in rivian big believer in electrification i still am uh and you came back and said look at i actually think that they're not going to grow as fast. That EV demand is going to slow, and ultimately, you've been spot on. And uh, I think that this, if we look at what's going on with Rivian, and separately, Lucid reported they also had some difficult numbers. Lord, their delivery numbers caught from fifteen thousand to seven thousand, much smaller, uh, but their stock's down fifteen percent. If you look at some of the commentary from uh, Rivian CEO on uh, on Squawk Box this morning, he talked about. This the high interest environment is having a negative impact on EVs. Uh, that's the same thing that Elon said, and I I buy that. I think that high interest rates do make a headwind here for EVs. But is there something more structural going on in terms of how people are thinking about switching to EVs? I think people are just getting to the point where they say, "Is it really that much better than gas?" I think it's that simple. You know, if gas prices aren't astronomical and they like the design, and I keep coming back to this too, a brand matters, design matters, function matters. If they like the design and the ability to just go and fill up their car in three minutes and get back on the road, I think that is still a useful value prop. I think electric is probably for, depends on where you live. If you live in the cold, it might not be the better option. Uh, like Minnesota, it's tougher. Um, but I think for a lot of people, electric probably is a better overall option for a car. But like I've been saying, it's just it's going to take way longer than people think to get that adoption curve uh, to to shift dramatically in favor of electric. And on top of that, I mean, look at Rivian. I mean, these are premium price vehicles. These are very expensive electric vehicles. They're not entry level vehicles. And so I think you might be seeing in the context of them maybe some even more saturation at the high mm -hmm. end of the yeah, market where there are more options. 75,000 plus. The R2, of course, expected to be out later this year, expected ASB 45 to 55,000. Uh, that should change the equation. There's a question, are they going to have enough capital to get R2 up to capacity? Because they got to build out this Georgia facility to do that. And uh, I mean, that's, that's all uh, accurate. I think that uh, it's pretty compelling to be able to fill up your car in three minutes. That's uh, quite a fast charging network. I actually say that sometimes when I fill up, we have two gas cars. Our next cars are going to be electric, but the uh, I'll say I'm going to charge the car, I'm trying to get myself in that that habit. But I'm still a believer in the benefits of electrification uh, just because I think cars right now are at a, a great place relative to the performance. I think they do have better performance than a gas car. It's not about uh, great performance, but just ease of use. You talk about going to the pump. I actually don't like going to the gas pump. And if um, you're in a, a lucky category, which I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be in where our home can have a charger at home, I think I would prefer that. So I'm still on board uh, with this. I think that Tesla's going to uh, right size things when their new production is going to come out. I'm still optimistic on that, but I, I think it's uh, fun to report back. You were negative on this. You were right. I'm glad that uh, the fund and myself heated that that direction, and we'll see how this plays out going forward. And one one other quick thing to add to when we think about Rivian, why the reaction? I actually don't think it is because they missed the supposed guidance. I doubt that any buy side yeah. investors thought they were going to do 85. I think. The problem is, if you look at the numbers, I believe that they basically guided for flat production year over year. 
They when did. you're supposed to be, you know, a great growth company and you're investing a lot of money, you're not generating earnings or cash flow, you can't have flat year over year numbers. It just doesn't work. Okay. Forget about consumer demand. For what, a minute. What about, I mean, isn't that it just doesn't work as a cash question? Story. He got asked it by Phil Abo this morning and he basically said we gotta evaluate our options when it comes to raising money. I think as a growth company and I hear about needing to raise money, that's that's a big red flag. Yeah, especially when you're not growing. That's the hard part. That's gonna be the hardest part. Makes sense. Uh, thankfully, Tesla doesn't need to raise cash. We'll jump to our final topic, which is related to AI. Something uh, happened this week related to Google. So they have a multimodal Gemini, Gemini Ultra. It's multimodal, which means you can put in, uh, you can ask it to do different things, whether it's through images, you can, as an image generator within it. But effectively, there was a, a kind of a squirrel this week around asking it to produce images of people and there were certain colors of people that were not represented that didn't make a ton of sense that essentially that the the ai was not representing what what happened in history and so it kind of created this stir around is google too biased and uh, when i first saw the story i actually didn't believe it and uh we went back and dug you played around with it. i don't know if you had that language out there but basically confirm that this did happen that that uh the gemini was showing some kind of false images and how it generated images since then they've paused it correct doug yeah we tried to use it earlier and the current prompt or sorry the current response you get if you give gemini a uh, image prompt is we are working to improve gemini's ability to generate images of people we expect this feature to return soon and we'll notify you in release updates when it does and when I saw this, I just thought uh, this is score one for Elon and X.AI because he's really trying to build a model that's true seeking. He is. And I think um, he gets criticism for X.AI. He gets criticism for Twitter because I think he also is trying to make Twitter a place for truth. Um, and some people don't uh, don't want the truth, I think. And that has nothing to do with politics of left or right. I think everybody wants their side to win. Everybody thinks their side is correct. Um, but some things are just factual, especially things that relate to history. And when you see um, kind of egregious changes uh, in how history is presented, I think it does invite these Orwellian sort of questions and comparisons where if AI is going to be this really powerful technology that shapes how humans think and right. how we interact with uh, information broadly, that information should be based on truth. And I think um, that the second thought I had, other than, you know, this seems ridiculous, was the first thought when I saw this Google issue. The second thought I had was exactly what you said, which is for all the, uh, I think, heat that Elon seems to get sometimes from a political perspective, what he's building is actually truly valuable, not just in an economic sense, but in a societal context. Like you have to have some mm -hmm. truth seeking. Uh, Oracle, right? You have to have something that adheres to fundamental reality. You can't just go and rewrite things because, you know, it seems like the nice thing to do. And I think that's what XAI stands for. And that's what Elon stands for. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're believers that this is going to rival Tesla and SpaceX, X.AI, in terms of generating uh, wealth for him. Uh, right now, his net worth based on Bloomberg is estimated to be $210 billion. But these models could be foundation models, top three foundation models could be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And I think that that uh, probability is on the table, informed by a lot of the real time intention that data that he can get from Twitter, uh, angling that into x.ai. And just want to uh, say one final topic here. Our, our goal, again, like you said, Doug, is we don't want to be political on it. We just want to recognize that there is this battle going on with AI and relative to how people think about the future and the past. And we just want to highlight that there are different companies going in different directions to try to solve that. So staying out of the political conversation, just the facts with Deep Tech 315. On behalf of Doug, I'm Gene. See you next week.